tot apul graes Maria, et macula originalis, non est in te. Revelation of a medal called Miraculous. And this is her own account. So it starts with the editor's description, but it gets to St. Catherine Labore's own account of what happened. The remote preparation for Mary's appearance to Catherine Labore occurred when her devout mother died when the little girl was nine years old. So this is the background to the story. It was a great sorrow to lose her mother, whom she loved dearly. Only one could replace her, and that was the Blessed Mother herself. It was related to her sister Ternine by one of the servants of the house, that she found the child perched atop a table which she had pushed close to a bureau with a statue of Our Lady on it. Clasping the statue in her arms, Catherine tearfully begged the Blessed Virgin Mary to take the place of her earthly mother. That wasn't all. She even hoped and prayed from that day forward that she would be able to see the Blessed Mother even in this life. Her desires were great, and Mary honored them, beginning on the night of July 18th to 19th, 1830, at the Mother House of the Sisters of Charity on Rue de Bac. The visionary, Sister Catherine Labore, writes, now this is her direct quote, The Feast of St. Vincent, that's St. Vincent de Paul, was approaching. He was the founder of her order, the Sisters of Charity. We'll get to that later. The Feast of St. Vincent de Paul was approaching. On the eve, our dear Mother Marta, one of the novice mistresses, instructed us on devotion to the saints, and in particular on devotion to the Blessed Mother. For how long a time I wished to see the Blessed Virgin. My desire became even stronger as time went on, and I went to bed that night with the thought I might see my dear mother that very night. We had each received from Mother Martha a little scrap of the surplus of St. Vincent. I cut mine in half and swallowed half before going to sleep, persuaded that St. Vincent would obtain for me the grace of seeing the Blessed Virgin. Don't try this yourself at home. The seminary sisters slept in a common dormitory, each one having her own alcove surrounded by curtains. I was asleep, Catherine continues, when at 11.30 I heard my name, Sister, Sister, Sister Catherine. I looked toward the side from which the voice came. It was the side of the passage. I lifted my curtain and saw a child of about five or six, dressed completely in white. He said, Come with me to the chapel. The Blessed Virgin awaits you. I thought at once that I would be overheard. Do not be troubled, said the child. It is half past eleven and everyone is asleep. Come, I am waiting. I dressed quickly and followed after the child. He was to my left and rays of light came from him. To my great astonishment, all the lights were shining brightly along the way. My astonishment increased when, at a slight touch of the child's finger, the heavy chapel door swung open. My amazement was at its height when I beheld all the candles and torches in the chapel lit, reminding me of midnight mass. However, I saw no sign of the Blessed Virgin. The child led me into the sanctuary on the side of the chaplain's chair. Here I knelt down while the child remained standing. All this while I was looking to see whether the sisters on watch would pass through the sanctuary. What would the sisters who were keeping the night watch say if they found Catherine in the sanctuary at such an hour? Back to the quote. Then a moment later the child said, Here is the Blessed Virgin. Here she is. I heard the rustling of a silken robe coming from the side of the sanctuary. The lady bowed down before the tabernacle and then she seated herself in Monsieur Richenet's chair, that's the chaplain's chair. Monsignor Richenet, that must be. This armchair was used by the chaplain whenever he gave a conference to the sisters. It was similar to a chair in a painting of St. Anne in the choir, 
but the lady did not look like St. Anne. Seeing that I did not know how to behave, the child spoke to me again. It is the Blessed Virgin. I am not able to say why, but it still seemed to me that it was not she whom I saw. It was then that the voice of the child changed and took on the deeper tones of a man's voice. He spoke again, repeating strongly his words for the third time. At this moment I rushed forward and knelt before the Blessed Virgin with my hands on her knees. I cannot express what I felt, but I am sure that this was the happiest moment of my life. The Blessed Virgin spoke to me of the way I ought to behave toward my director, and she also confided to me some things which I am not permitted to reveal. She told me how to act in times of distress. Pointing with her left hand toward the altar steps, she told me to come there to refresh my heart, and she said that it was there that I would find all the solace that I needed. When I asked what was the meaning of what I had seen, she explained it to me completely. I do not know how much time went by. Her leaving me was like that of a light which goes out. She disappeared as she had come. She has gone, the child said, and together we returned the way we had come. He continued to walk on my left side and to light up the way. It is my belief that this child, so resplendent in miraculous light, was my guardian angel, and that he had made himself visible in order that I might see the Blessed Virgin, whom I had prayed so hard to see in this life. When I returned to the dormitory, it was two o'clock in the morning. I went back to bed, but I could not sleep again that night. Some months before she died in 1876, Catherine added the following lines to what she had written in 1856. Our Lady having then given her permission to do so. My child, God wishes to entrust to you a mission. It will be the cause of great suffering to you, but you will surmount it with the thought that it will work to God's glory. You will know later what this mission is to be, and you will be troubled until you have told your spiritual director. You will be contradicted, but do not fear. Grace will be given to help you. Tell your director of what you have seen. Once more, have confidence and do not fear. Through your prayers, inspiration will be given to you. The times are very evil. Great misfortune will come to France. Her throne will be overthrown. The whole world will be upset by evils of every kind. The Blessed Virgin seemed very much grieved when she said this. But come to the foot of this altar where a great grace awaits all, whether they be great or little, who ask fervently and with confidence. End of the quote from uh, St. Catherine Labrie. The Blessed Mother then told Catherine how she was pleased to shower graces on her community, for she loved it very much. However, there were great abuses and the rule was not observed very well. Our Lady told Catherine that the future superior, who will come soon, must do all in his power to restore regular observance. God will then bless the community and it will become very large, as it subsequently did. In these troubled times, Our Lady predicted that she and St. Vincent de Paul, who was the founder of their community, would watch over the two families of men and women religious. There's more prophecy here. It's not directly relevant, but I think it's good to remind ourselves of um, the Blessed Virgin Mary's ability to know the future, let's say. The Blessed Mother then added, It will not be well, alas, with other religious houses in which there will be many victims. Our Lady wept when she said this. There will also be victims among the clergy of Paris. The Archbishop himself will die. At these words she wept again. The cross will be insulted. Blood will flow in the streets. Here the Blessed Virgin could speak no longer, so great was her grief which was shown on her face. Catherine questioned in her mind when these evils would come about and understood in forty years. And so it happened in 1870. As related, Our Lady had told her, God wishes to entrust to you a mission. 
Four months later, on Saturday, November 27, 1830, this mission was made known to her. Okay, so in this first apparition in July, the Blessed Virgin Mary just basically told her, you're going to have a mission to do. It's going to cause you great suffering. Don't worry. Have confidence. Come to the tabernacle when you need solace and so forth. And terrible times are coming on France, but that wasn't part of the public not you know it wasn't part of the message for her to repeat even even 20 years later she had to wait 40 years before she was allowed to say that actually after it already happened she was allowed to say it only in 1876 1876 46 years later yeah so anyway so um so in that first apparition the Blessed Virgin Mary did not show herself as she looks on the Miraculous Medal, and she did not tell Catherine Labore to have the Miraculous Medal cast. That waited until the second apparition about four months later. On that first apparition, the Blessed Virgin Mary was sitting in the uh, chaplain's chair, and uh, St. Catherine Labore, lucky young lady, was able to put her hands on the Blessed Virgin Mary's knees while she was talking. Anyway, four months later, uh, the mission was made known to her. There are two phases to this most important apparition. That is the second one. For, uh, the second apparition, there are two phases to. In the first, Mary offers the world to God. In the second, she offers the grace of God to the world. In the first phase, Catherine saw the traditional representation of the Immaculate Conception. Her eyes were raised to heaven. She stood erect upon a large white sphere. Her feet were standing upon a serpent. At the level of her breast, she held a little golden ball surmounted by a cross, and this she was offering to God. So in the first, uh, I'll, I'll hold up a picture, okay? There's a picture in this book of how she appeared in the first um, in the first uh, phase of the apparition, and this is how she appeared, okay? She was standing, but she her arms were not down. Her arms were at her chest, and she was holding a globe like that. So that's how she appeared in the fir first part of the second apparition. She stood erect upon a large white sphere. Her feet were standing upon a serpent. This is um, how she appeared in the first half, and let me zoom in. Okay. So she was standing on a white globe, which you see under her feet. This is, by the way, the statue is in the place where it happened. This is in the chapel of the Miraculous Medal in Paris. Okay, so she's standing on a white globe, and there is a crushed serpent under her feet, although that's not so easy to see in that picture. And then she is holding a, she is holding a golden globe at her, the height of her chest. So this is the first half, the first phase. At the level of her breast, she held a little golden ball surmounted by a cross, and this she was offering to God. We'll see why later. Both the golden globe and the white sphere represented the earth and its people. Although Catherine saw no more than half of the white sphere, she was happy as a French woman to behold on it her country and the name of France. So... I don't think you can see it on this, and I don't know if it's on the statue, but on the top half of the white sphere, she beheld France and the name France. Suddenly, the golden orb disappeared. Our Lady extended her hands toward the earth. And so this is now the um, more typical image uh, that we have. Whoops. Like that where um, her hands are extended towards the earth. On her fingers were precious stones of different sizes, and from them came rays of light which fell upon the sphere at her feet. But some of these stones did not cast rays. Just as I was observing this, continues Catherine, the Blessed Virgin turned her eyes to me, and I heard a voice within me. The sphere which you see is the world. It includes France and every inhabitant of the earth. The rays of light which come from my hands are the graces which I shower on those who ask for them. 
Our Lady gave me to understand with what generosity and great joy she dispenses graces. But, the Blessed Virgin added sadly, there are graces for which I am not asked, and it is for this reason that some of the stones you see are not sending forth rays of light. Then the second phase of the apparition immediately followed. An oval form formed around the figure of the Mediatrix of all graces, and around the outer edge the following words were inscribed. O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Hence you see them inscribed there. In the apparition of Mary clasping a golden orb to her breast which symbolized the earth, the Blessed Virgin wished to show how dear this world is to her and how great is her love for all its people. It was for this reason, Catherine said, that Mary asked me during my prayers to have a statue made showing her clasping the world to her heart with a commemorative altar set up in the place where she first appeared. And fortunately, we have that here. But anyway, there is the statue where Mary appeared to the right of the altar, the statue that Mary had asked for, asked Catherine Labore for, of holding the golden globe in front of her heart. The second phase of the apparition immediately followed, an oval frame formed around the figure of the Mediatrix of all graces, and around the outer edge the following words were inscribed, O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us of recourse to thee. Once again the voice made itself heard within my heart, have a medal struck, just as you see. Those who wear it with devotion around their neck and who confidently say this prayer will receive great graces and will enjoy the special protection of the Mother of God. Then the frame reversed itself to show me the other side of the medal. What Catherine now saw was Mary's monogram, a large M, large M surmounted by a cross having a double bar under it. Beneath this, the holy hearts of Jesus and Mary were placed side by side, the first being crowned with thorns and the second having pierced by a sword. And around the outer part were twelve stars. This was the end of the vision. Okay, but anyway, it was not easy to get the medal made. I told, went to her director and eventually uh, he told the story to the archbishop. The archbishop said, I want to be the first to have the medal. And that kind of uh, gave the director a kick in the pants. And he had the medal made. He had 1,500 medals struck, which he received on June 30th of 1831. When Catherine was given a medal, she found it conformed to the model and said, the important thing now is to make it widely known. Now, it was the um, priests of the, the Lazarists, which were St. Vincent de Paul's order that he had founded, and, and also the Daughters of Charity, working with their pupils and the sick, who spread the medal rapidly. The medal became so popular that the engraver was overwhelmed with orders. Between June of 1832 and February of 1836, he made over 100,000 medals. He could not keep up with the supply. Over 2.2 million medals were supplied in those early days. In less than four years in France alone, 11 million of the medals were made. Okay, so this is supernatural. Now, they were originally called the Medal of the Immaculate Conception, but within two years, they started being called the Miraculous Medal because there were so many miracles associated with them. Uh, St. Catherine Labre's uh, spiritual director produced a booklet about the apparitions and also about miracles attributed to the Miraculous Medal. The booklet tells how, by contact with the metal, cures were affected from insanity, leprosy, scurvy, tuberculosis, tumors, dropsy, epilepsy, hernia, paralysis, typhoid and other fevers, canker, fractures, scrofula, palpitation of the heart, and cholera. cholera. To it were also described miracles of protection and preservation in war, in shipwreck, in accidents, and even in duels. Tota pulcra es Maria, et macula origin.